Hi, this is David Hillier here, and my video today will show you how to calculate the beta or systematic risk of an equity using real data. Okay, so we're still focusing on equities and we're still focusing on the cost of capital, uh, the cost of equity capital. We spent the last video using CAPM and taking the beta or the systematic risk of, a, of an equity as given. And we use that to arrive at a cost of equity capital for an all equity company. So this video is going to show you how you would actually use real data and the problems with using real data in calculating the, the beta of a company. So we already know the formula for the beta of uh, an equity. It's the covariance between the returns on the equity and the returns in the market divided by the variance of the market. The best way to look at this is that this is the, the degree of co-movement. Uh, the, 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 the covariance term is the degree of co-movement between the security that you're interested in and the market. It could also be viewed as a sensitivity of the security's returns to the market. And then in the denominator, you're standardizing this term in the numerator by the, the variance of the market. So the more volatile the market is, then the lower the, the actual beta or the systematic risk of that uh, security could be. So the, this is just the, um, the standardization term, and this is the sensitivity or the covariance or co-movement term. Now, you can, if you want, um, just find the covariance between a security's returns and the market returns and then divide that by the variance of the market. But the beta uh, and this particular formula is also the formula for the slope of a linear regression. Uh, and so you can undertake a, a, an ordinary least squares regression uh, analysis to find the slope um, or the, the coefficient uh, on the the market term, and that is the beta uh, that you're using. So let's focus then on some of the issues before we, we actually talk about using the real data. Um, there are a number of issues with using data to estimate beta, and in actual fact, if you were to look at um, lots of different websites, uh, financial websites like the FTE.com or Reuters or, or Yahoo Finance, for any one particular company, you may actually find different estimates of beta. Uh, and that's just because you're using real data and uh, you're using samples of data. And the samples uh, can lead to different estimates. And and that is one of, one of the issues that we face. Normally, uh, you would use... Uh, monthly data, uh, so monthly returns data uh, over a period of about five years. Um, that gives you 60 observations, 12 months times five years gives you 60 observations. That is enough uh, of a sample size in, in order to undertake a regression analysis. You might think that, well, okay, instead of using just 60 observations, why not use 120 observations? So that's 10 years. Of monthly data. The problem with that is that a company can change over 10 years, so the risk of that company, maybe say five, six years ago, may be different from the systematic risk of the company today. So having too large a time period for your sample can be problematic. It might give you more power in your ordinary least squares regression, but it can lead to maybe erroneous measures of the risk as it of a company as it stands today. You might then argue, well, uh, you should maybe use less observations. So let's say two years of monthly data. Uh, two years of monthly data gives you 24 observations. But then the sample size is very small and you then lack power in your ordinary least squares regression. You also have issues to do with uh, betas moving over time uh, in relation to how the company is doing in, in, you know, with uh, respect to maybe macroeconomic events. 
uh, at the moment in March uh, 2015, we're seeing the oil price being very low. And that can have a big impact on the the expenses of a company that uses lots of oil, but it can also have a big impact on um, the uh, the revenues of oil producing firms, and that can have an impact on the risk of the companies. So we might not see changes in how the the actual company is performing or the risk of the specific company, but outside factors may be affecting the risk of the company. So there are not a lot of uh, things that you know we need to consider when we re use real data to estimate betas. We do have some solutions, but the solutions are effectively statistical type solutions. Um, you know, we haven't even talked about using daily data versus using monthly data versus using annual data. Uh, daily data, in my experience with the European companies, using daily data for beta estimates is is really quite problematic because there's just so much noise with daily data um, that you actually find you get very low betas um, for all but for the largest companies. Using annual data, you're stripping out that noise, but then you have less observations. You need to have, say, you know, kind of a large number of years of data if you're using annual data in order to get anything anything meaningful from your estimates. So that's why I say focus on monthly data and then use five years. That tends to be the rule of thumb. You can also um, work with uh, some betas. If, if you've got issues to do with, say, for example, too much leverage, uh, that is too much debt in the capital structure, or maybe um, you know, you, you've got some issues to do with what the company is, is, is doing at this point in time, you can try and control for that. So, for example, uh, I talked about the oil price, the oil returns. Maybe you could put, add in an oil factor, uh, oil return factor, to strip out the impact of oil price movements um, from your, your beta estimates. So, there are a number of things that you can actually do. It may be that you're not particularly happy with uh, the company uh, data itself, it might be that it's a, a short-lived company, maybe it's only two years old or uh, less than that. Uh, it may be that the company has gone through a very difficult time or a, a crisis period or a transition period. So the beta that you're seeing at this point in time isn't actually reflective of betas in uh, or normally you would see for that company. And so you could then say, well, okay, instead of using the company beta, you could use the industry beta. So I've spent quite a wee bit of time there talking about some of the issues with estimating beta. Now let's just go ahead and uh, do some calculations. Now to start off, I'm just going to show you um, plots of, uh, first of all, returns on uh, an equity. Uh, we've got KPM here and Danone against returns on the market. Now the first thing you can see, this is using real data. It's using five years of data. So there are 60 observations here that We've got a beta estimate of 0.186 for KPN, and we have a beta estimate of 0.484 for Danone. But that beta estimate is the slope of the regression line. Uh, but you can actually see that there are a lot of outliers. So even although you've got uh, a beta measure that might be significant, there is an awful lot of noise in uh, the relationship, even at the monthly level, the monthly data level. Think about what it would be like at the daily data uh, level. So that's something to again to be aware of that just because you have a significant beta from a regression doesn't necessarily mean that it's a, you know it's, it's a perfect relationship. It's not. You've got a lot of outliers there. Now I'm going to focus on Unicredit. You can see the date here is March the 17th 2015. I, uh, I'm, I'm going to just try and keep it um, even, so I'm just going to take data up to uh, the end of 2014 uh, here. Now you notice that um, from 2010, uh, you know, after the financial crisis and then the, the, the European, the Eurozone crisis, the Unicredit price bottomed out at the beginning of 2012. That's probably at its most risky, and you can see there's a lot of volume trading here a lot more than uh, before in 2011 and slowly the company has been doing better slowly the company has been less risk although we can see here that we've seen a drop of 3.31 percent in its uh, price over the last year 
Now notice this beta measure. This is the beta measure that the FT gives us. It's 1.71. Um, and uh, that's what we'll, uh, we'll use uh, just now. Um, when I actually put the slice together, I think if I remember, that was 1.70. So it means that FT is actually, even within uh, two, two hours, that the betas are continually being updated automatically. Uh, but we'll come back to that. So just remember that, that measure, 1.71. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, move to uh, Excel. And you can see that uh, I've got the Eurostox 50. So that the Eurostox 50 is an index. It's a market index. It's the an index of the 50 largest Eurozone companies. And Unicredit is one of those companies. These are the returns. I'm going back five years. Uh, so they're monthly data uh, going all the way back uh, from the 31st of the 12th all the way back to uh, the 29th of the 1st. The so that's the, the return that you would get for January. That's the return you'd get for February in 2010. And that's the market index and that's the uh, the overall um, uh, returns for Unicredit. So we want to calculate the, the beta and we use the function slope. Uh, slope of the known y's. Uh, so the known y's are uh, the Unicredit and the known X's are the the Euro uh, the Eurostox index. So we're given a slope uh, a beta here of two point zero four. Now notice how that's different from the FT of one point seven one. It's higher, so that's quite unusual. Um, I'm, I'm going to maybe increase the size of this this screen just to make it so that we get a bit more. Yeah, you can look at that. It's a bit easier. Okay, so using the slope, just using the five years of data, we've got a beta of 2.04 for Unicredit. FT has a beta of 1.71. Um, but I'm using five years of data using 12 months uh, per year, so it's 60 observations. Let's look at how the beta has changed. Now, I know I'm not going to be statistically powerful here, but I'm going to um, regress the just over the monthly returns over one year. So we're only going to have 12 observations. And uh, we're going to look say, well, okay, what was the beta of Unicredit uh, at the end of 2010? So just use the term slope. Um, I've got 12 observations. Um, again, the first set that you're looking at is the, the, the company returns, and then the second set is the market returns. And we have a beta of 2.0 at the end of 2010. Now, if I copy this down, this formula down, then what I'm doing is I'm moving the data forward. So we we'll still get 12 months of data, but we're now adding in a new observation here. We're making it more current, but we're keeping the number of periods the same. So it's just 12 observations. And you can see that as we move into 2011, the risk, the systematic risk of Unicredit increases. And I'm going to do this all the way to the end of 2014. Now look at what we're seeing here. We're seeing that the, the beta ha increases during 2011. It then starts to drop until we get to 2012. And then it really starts to grow uh, quite significantly uh, into about October 2013. And then it starts to drop again. So you can see that just using that small num uh, number of observations, looking at a rolling beta, so we're just taking the 12 months, the, the pre previous 12 months, and we're just moving it down each period so that we're updating with the newest observations but keeping the number of observations the same. You can see that the beta changes a lot during that period, and that is a problem. It's a problem because, you know, if it depends on where you do your analysis. Uh, should you do your analysis using 12 months or do it 24 months or 30 months, you're actually going to get different estimates. So the estimate that we have for um, FT 1.71, they will have un, you know carried out a number of smoothing uh, operations in order to get uh, what they feel is a representative beta. But we are only using data, so it's not anything which is, is tied in theory. And you can see that our beta has gone up and it has gone down during that period. So if we then move to uh, back to our 
or slides, we can you know consider that well maybe using company data might not be the best thing maybe we should use industry data so i've looked at uh, and i've taken this information from reuters um this is this is only a snapshot from reuters of the betas of lots of different bank banks and the weighted average for the the banking sector is 1.21 so instead of using a beta of uh, two or, or coming up to three or whatever or using the FT beta uh, for that company which is 1.7 it may actually make more sense to us to say well, okay let's just take the, the industry beta for the company that strips out all of the different variability that you might see um, on a, a you know kind of month to month basis and it, it, it gets rid of that you know kind of maybe any variability that you might you know that, that you get with using company data and then you're using the industry data. So we've got a sector weighted average of 1.21. And so it really is up to you what you want to do uh, if you use the beta in your cost of equity capital. Uh, we start off with some assumptions. Now I'm, I'm using CAPM here. Okay, so um, with the assumption is we've got the risk free rate just using 2%. We use um, a market risk premium of 6%. 6 now, as I said, when I put this slide together just this morning, uh, the beta was 1.70. It's changed, as you saw, uh, to 1.71. But um, you've got the 1.70. Let's just assume it's 1.70 just now. So the expected return or the cost of equity using the company data, the Unicredit data, is going to be the risk-free rate plus the beta times the market risk premium, which is 12.2%. If we were to use the industry beta, then we've still got the same risk-free rate, we've still got the same market risk premium, we're just using a different beta. And that gives us a cost of equity capital of 9.26%. The choice that you go with in practice will be dependent upon the nature of the company. You might even decide, well, I'm going to take an average, a weighted average of those two, or an equally weighted average of those two. That isn't the most accurate, it isn't the most precise approach, but in actual fact, because you're using all this data, Trying to just get a consensus value or a median value sometimes is just the best approach. So hopefully uh, you found that uh, interesting and um, I'll see you again. Thank you very much.